Now, the Vikings uh, raided out of what we now call the Scandinavian countries. And their greatest, their greatest time of raiding, uh, when they were the most powerful, was from about uh, 800 A.D. to 1000 A.D., uh, more or less 1,000 to 1,200 years ago. They were incredible sailors, and they raided all the way from, well, they traveled all the way from Greenland, all the way, raided all along the coasts of Europe, and all the way down in the, tide, in the time of their highest powers, all the way down um, the coasts of northern Africa. Um, incredible sailors. And I don't understand boating, but they built their boats in a way that uh, has, wasn't done before and hasn't been done since, as I understand it. When you build a boat, whether it's a steel boat or a wooden boat, normally the process is you build a framework and you cover the framework with skin. Uh, it doesn't matter. That's the way you build boats. Well, the Vikings didn't build their boats that way. They made the skin first of overlapping boards, and then they put the framework inside. Now, I, I don't understand this, but it made the boat flex, that is, move just a little bit. And uh, it also made the boats in the flexing and in the sea very fast, able to deal with rough water and be very, very fast. Now, the boats uh, did have oars, but they had a, generally had a single mast with um, a square sail. And as you know, you, you know, often there was a dragon or something carved on the bow, on the, off the bow of the, of the boat. But they were very distinctive boats with that square sail. They had no covering for the men riding in them or rowing in them. There was no covering. They could, you know, put skins over themselves, but there was no, like, canopy or anything like that. They were open to the elements. And... Scandinavia uh, is on the edge of the North Sea, and that's one of the roughest oceans in the world. And these boats were remarkable for being able to navigate the storms in the North Sea and also, with wind, uh, be very, very fast. Now, the Vikings generally engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, they're, they used bows and arrows and, and weapons like that, but their principal, their th principal weapons were three. And the first was an axe with a, uh, about a uh, eh, 14 or 15 inch wooden handle and an iron head, usually just one edge, not a double headed, although the TV series show double headed. They generally were a single blade of off an iron head and razor sharp. The second weapon they used was a sword with about a four foot long, four foot, well, this isn't four feet, but about a four foot long blade uh, for, for pretty close in fighting. The third weapon they used was a spear. Now, it wasn't a throwing spear. It was a stabbing spear, and it had a generally had a 15 inch, about a 15 inch blade, razor sharp on both sides, and at the base of the blade was a blocker, a upright piece uh, at right angles to the blade. Now the reason for the blocker was in hand to hand fighting. What's, you had people all around you trying to kill you, right? <laughs> so the, the reason for the blocker was to stop the blade from uh, getting caught up in somebody's body. So if I have a blade and a shaft, a spear shaft, these were not throwing spears, they were stabbing spears, and a shaft, and I 
stab you without a blocker, that razor sharp blade will go right through you and out the other side. And when I try to pull it out, it can get twisted in your body. And the guy who's coming at me from over here, uh, in that fraction of a time when I'm struggling with the blade can kill me. So the blocker was to stab and pull out quickly because the blocker wouldn't let the blade go more than 15 inches into the body because when the blocker hit the body, the blade stopped and you could pull it out really, really fast. So those were their three principal weapons. They had others, but those were the three, three principal weapons they used because they were mostly doing hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Now, this story starts uh, at the end of a fjord, and a fjord is a long, narrow lake that ends in the ocean. At the end of a fjord in what is now known as Norway. Now, up at the end of the fjord was a village, and the village was made out of log houses with, uh, for the most part, roofs of sod, which is dirt, on out of which grew grass. So uh, you would have goats and animals up on the top of the roofs eating the grass. Uh, and the story starts at about, roughly about this time of year, about, uh, about March. And there was a meeting at the leader's house, and the leader's name was Balder. And he was looking for men to go on a raid with him about six weeks later in what would be early May. And he called all the men in the village into his house, and he picked 25 men. So there would be 26 plus himself, including himself, 26 including himself. And the last man he picked was a 17-year-old boy whose name was Lars. Lars yeah, stood maybe five foot seven, five foot eight. He was very slender, very strong. He had shoulder length, blonde hair, and brilliant blue eyes. It was the first time Lars had ever been chosen for a raid, and it was a great honor. So as soon as the meeting was over, he went home to tell his mother and father. And when he got into their log house, he told them what had happened. And his father said, we need to outfit you for this raid. Now, his father had no left arm. It had been cut off in a battle in England about 10 years before on a raid. And fortunately, it was at the end of the battle when he was hit with a sword and it almost took off his left arm at the shoulder. It was dangling by tendons and muscles. And... Fortunately, it was right at the end of the battle, and the Vikings very, very quickly built a fire and put a sword into on the top of the flames of the fire, and the sword got red hot. And then five men held Lars's father down, and a sixth man, man with his axe, cut the arm free from the shoulder, what was left of the arm, grabbed the red-hot sword blade off the fire, and with a flat, flat side of the blade, jammed it against uh, Lars's father's shoulder. Now, that's called cauterizing. That's sealing off, bleeding, uh, vessels and veins with with a very, very hot metal surface. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you were out in the wilderness on a backpack trip today and you cut yourself very, very badly and it was bleeding, 
you could heat any metal surface like the blade of a pocket knife or a pan or a pot, anything, you could heat it really, really hot and jam it on that wound. Now, it's going to burn the skin and everything, but it's going to stop the bleeding. And in Lars' father's case, it saved his life, stopped him from bleeding to death. So now, 10 years later, he hasn't, he hadn't been able to go on any raids, of course. And he, when Lars comes home and tells him this, uh, that he's been chosen, he goes over to a corner of the room and brings out three bundles wrapped in skins. And he unwraps the first bundle and it's his battle axe. And the shaft has been worn and worn. The wood is all darkened, but he's, he's kept it carefully wrapped and he's kept the iron blade oiled all these years and razor sharp. And he says, you're going on your first raid. You need my battle axe and hands the axe to Lars. The second bundle he unwraps is his spear. Again, a wooden shaft that's been used and used and used. It's darkened with all the use. A shining blade and blocker that's been kept razor sharp all these years. And he says, for your first raid, you need my spear. And then he unwraps the last bundle and pulls out a sword in a scabbard. He pulls the sword out of the scabbard, and it is a beautiful, beautiful sword. The blade is four feet long, shiny, shiny um, steel, probably made in Spain. Um, the best knives and swords for years and years, even to this day, the a lot of the best cutting instruments are made in Spain. And both sides of this uh, sword blade were razor sharp. There was a blocker at the base of the blade and a leather wrapped handle. And on the end of the handle was a clasp. And in the clasp was a big green emerald. On the face of the blade, the flat side of the blade, both sides of the blade, was etched the figure of a dragon. And the dragon figure on the blade was about that long, beautifully etched, which means cut into the metal. Figure of a dragon. And his father says, for your first raid, you need my sword. And <clears throat> Lars goes, where did you get that sword? It's absolutely beautiful. And his father says, when I was just a little older than you, I took it from an English knight in a battle that we won. And he looks, he holds the sword and hands it over to Lars. So, about six weeks later, in early May, um, 26 men, Balder and 25 others, set off down the fjord in, the, in their boat. And they have to row. There's not much wind in the fjord. They have to row until they get out into the open ocean. And then they set sail and go down uh, south along the shores of what's now Scandinavia, and ultimately, a couple of days later, wind up on the shore of what we now call France, across what we now call the English Channel, which is about 21 miles across from England, and from some white cliffs uh, that we call today the cliffs, the white cliffs of Dover. And they camp on the French side. And Balder says, uh, tomorrow we're sailing across to England and we're going to attack a village there. And he says, uh, you know, we need some meat 
for supper tonight. Does anybody want to go into the forest and go hunting? And Lars volunteers. And Lars takes a bow and arrows, and he straps the sword and his battle axe to his waist. And he's wearing kind of a, kind of like what we we call a vest. It's 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 fairly warm, but it's sort of like a vest. It's a heavy, uh, uh, sort of like a no sleeved, uh, a little bit longer than waist length uh, garment made out of a bearskin. So he straps the. Uh, the sword and the battle axe onto his waist, grabs the bow and arrows, and takes off. Now, the forest at in those times was different from the forest today. The trees were generally enormous, went way, way, way up, and the leaves were all at the top of the trees, and they kind of made a canopy over the ground. So there wasn't much brush under the trees, the way there is in our forest today, and the trees in America, before we cut them all down for ships and building houses and everything, the trees in the forest in America were very much the same early, early, early on. So you could move pretty well through the trees. And he hunted for about 20, 25 minutes, and then he saw uh, a stag, which would be like a, a an American elk, a little bit smaller than an elk, but sort of the same kind of animal. So he stalked the stag and got close and let loose an arrow and then another arrow and the stag ran a few yards and died. So Lars goes up to the stag and puts his bow and arrows down and he gets out a knife and he turns the stag on its back and he cuts the stag from its chest all the way down to between its back legs and starts pulling out the guts, which is what you do hunting. And why, why he was doing it was he didn't want to carry all that stuff back to the camp. The stag would be heavy enough. He didn't need to carry all that stuff. And he's bent down on one knee over the stag, pulling the guts out of its body when he hears a noise and he turns to look over his right shoulder and coming through the forest at a dead run was an enormous bear coming straight at him. The bear had smelled the blood and the bear was coming for meat and there was practically no time to do anything. As the bear got right up to him, it stood up on his back legs. And Lars, without hesitation, whirled to his right, pulling his sword, and slashed the bear across the chest as hard as he could with the sword. Now, the sword was razor sharp. But it wasn't gonna, that wasn't going to kill the bear. It, it hurt him. It went right to his rib cage. I mean, the bear has ribs just like we do. It went right, it cut right through his fur into his rib cage. But that wasn't going to stop the bear. I mean, that, not, that's not going to kill the bear. And the force of the blow knocked the blade out of Lars's hand and it fell on the ground. The bear backs up roaring. He's on his two back legs, and Lars grabs the battle axe out of his belt and charges the bear and runs right up against the bear as fast as he can, as hard as he can. He raises the battle axe over his head and buries it in the bear's throat. Now that is a fatal wound. And the bear is striking at Lars with its, with its legs, with its claws. But Lars reaches his left arm around the bear and grabs its fur and pulls himself up as tight as he can against the bear's chest. And the bear can whack at him 
with its claws, but he's got his his vest on, and it 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 tears the vest, but it's very hard because he's so close to the bear. It's very hard for the bear to do any damage, and they struggle back and forth on the ground, still the bear on its back legs, and then the bear falls over dead on top of Lars. Well, he, he squirms and wriggles around and finally pushes the bear off him. He's covered with blood and rolling around on the dirt trying to get out from the bear. He's covered with blood and dirt, not his own blood, the bear's blood, and he is a mess. Well, he gets up. First thing he does is he cleans his weapons. It's the first thing you do because when you're when you were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, you always clean your weapons, keep them clean all the time. So he cleans the sword, cleans the battle axe, gets his bows and arrows, grabs the stag by the horns, and starts dragging it to camp. And 20 minutes later, he comes into camp, and Balder says, what happened to you? And Lars says, if anybody wants any bear meat, there's some bear meat back there in the forest and leaves the stag on the ground. Well, the, the Vikings did like bear meat and some of them went back and cut some bear steaks off. And that night they had what we would call elk, uh, but stag steaks and bear steaks and went to sleep. Now the next morning at the village, on the English side, under the cliffs, everybody's sleeping. And it's just, just barely coming to be dawn. Now, there was a village of about 50 or 60 people, men, women, and children, in whitewashed stone houses. And then to the side was a two-story, big, sturdy, sturdy house in which lived a knight and about 10 to 12 soldiers. And the relationship between them was the knight provided protection for the village, and the villagers gave the knight food. They had pigs and chickens and uh, grew vegetables and stuff, and they supplied food to the knight, and he provided protection for the village. Very nice relationship. Well, just imagine that you're one of the kids in one of the houses, and your job is to feed the chickens first thing in the morning. Very, very first thing in the morning. You're supposed to feed the chickens. So you grab, you wake up, and you're, you're rubbing your eyes, and you're tired, and you grab the sack of chicken corn, probably, and you drag it outside, and you're throwing, you're throwing, uh, you know, you're throwing corn to the chickens. And they're starting to cluck and come around, and it's foggy, and you're you're not far from the edge of the ocean. I mean, real close, and it's foggy, and it's starting to get clear, and it's foggy, and you look out to see. And there's a break in the clouds, and you see a boat coming towards the shore with a single mast and a square red sail. And you know exactly, all the people along the coastlines knew exactly what that was. It was too far away. It was still about a mile away. It was too far away for you to see the dragon head carved at the top of the bow. You didn't have to see it. You knew exactly what that was. And in one second, you're in the house screaming at the top of your lungs, the Vikings are coming, the Vikings are coming. And in no time flat, the village is up and in an uproar, and somebody is beating on the knight's door, telling him the Vikings are coming, and all the villagers gather around. The women and children are sent back into the hills to hide. 
the men grab hoes and axes and any kind of tools with an edge that they have, and they're all kind of clustered around facing the shore. The night soldiers come out, they get their armor on, they generally have chest armor and helmets, and the knight's war horse is led out of the stable, and the knight comes out in full suit of armor, helmet, shield, leg armor, full armor, and they have to have a pulley to raise him up because he's so heavy onto the back of the war horse. Well, all of this, while all of this is taking place, the Vikings are getting closer and closer. And by the time the knight's ready and the soldiers are ready and the men of the village are ready, the Viking boat comes up onto the sand and 25 wild-looking, crazy-looking men line up along the shore. They have red beards or blonde beards or brown beards and fierce eyes, and some of them have helmets. Not many. They're just hair is wild and crazy, and they're holding axes and swords, and they line up in a line, and they're wearing fur you know, clothing and boots up to their knees and they're standing there. And the last one out of the out of the ship is Balder. And he gets out and he's holding in his hand a stone bowl about that big. And he reaches one hand back into the boat and pulls out a a stick with a knot, of sa a sappy knot, uh, which means just a, a round end of the stick. It was a part of a tree on one end. And he holds the bowl up and he blows into it. And in a minute or two, flames rise up from the bowl. In the bowl were the coals from their fire last night. It was a stone bowl, and in the bowl were the coals, and blowing on them, they ignite into flames. And he takes the stick and puts the sappy end into the bowl, and it ignites, flares up, and starts burning. And then he takes the stick and puts it into the boat and sets the boat on fire. Now, if you're watching this as one of the soldiers or as one of the villagers, you're saying, what is he doing? He's just burned his only method of escape. These people mean business. That's what's going through your mind. And as the boat catches on fire, 26 berserkers charge across the sand at the villagers and at the soldiers, screaming and yelling and waving swords and axes and everything. Well, the villagers want no part of that. They don't even stick around. They just take off. It's too scary. They just, they're not armed that well, and they just turn around and run for the hills. Well, the, uh, the soldiers the, uh, for the night, they make an attempt to fight. But in about two minutes, two of them are down dead. And the rest of them turn and run for the hills. The last one left is the knight on his war horse. And he is surrounded by men hacking and beating on his armor. And he can't, he's about to be dragged off and killed. And he spurs the war horse through the Vikings and off up into the hills and disappears. In less than 15 minutes, the Vikings have take, taken complete control of the village, the knight's house, everything that's in it, and nobody is coming back to challenge him. Well, they settle in. Now, they are wonderful boat makers, as I've said. They are wonderful boat makers. They've got the pigs, the chickens, 
the vegetables that were starting to grow, they've got all whatever gold and treasure was in the knight's house. They've got all of that. They and the villagers and the soldiers in the night, they're not, they're, they're not going to come back against these guys. And so over the next couple of months, they build a new boat. Now, it's not as good as the one they came in, but it's good enough. And, you know, they've got, they've got the axes and stuff that were left in the village. They cut down trees, shape trees. They've got all the food they need, and eh, it takes them two, two, three months. And they rebuild a boat, and they start sailing up along north along the shore of England, on the, along the English Channel. They start sailing north. Now, the people of England are watching them all the way from the hillsides back from the ocean. They're watching them all the way. And they sail north for two or three days, and they, and they stop and make camp. Nobody bothers them. And they get about three days up the coast, and Balder says, now, there's another village on the very tip of England, and it's the, what we would now call Scotland, on the very north tip of England that I want to attack. But we want to go out to sea and disappear from sight. So they will think we've gone home. And then in the, we'll sail out of sight to the north and make a turn and come back in the dim mists of the morning and attack this village on the very, uh, very edge, northern edge of England. And I believe there's a lot of treasure in that village. So the Vikings were pretty fired up about that. So they, they executed their plan. They sailed away from the shores, out into the ocean, out of sight, going east as though they were going home. As soon as it got dark, they, guided by the stars, made their way north, quite a ways north, and then executed a half circle and prepared to sail in the morning hours, in the, in the late night hours, in the very early morning hours, onto that village. The only problem was that that night, a humongous storm blew into the North Sea, really a hurricane. And 70 mile an hour winds, just enormous waves, a tremendous storm. Now the Vikings were perfectly able to handle the storm as sailors, but what you do in a storm generally is you aim the boat into the wind but the wind was so strong and making such enormous waves that Balder decided they couldn't do that. They had to turn the boat and go with the wind. That is, let the wind blow them. And that's what they did. Now, the only problem was that the wind didn't stop. Day after day after day, the storm went on blowing them west. On the eighth day, it started to calm. And on the morning of the ninth day, it was just a breeze. They had had plenty of water because there was, there was a huge storm around them, but they were out of food and one of the Vikings with very, very sharp eyes said he thought he saw a coastline to the west. And so with oars and with their, they got their sail up. They had taken the mast and the sail down the minute the storm hit. They put their sail up. And that evening they came to a pretty flat coastline with forests right almost to the edge of the water. And 
they made their way along the coastline to the left uh, until they found a, a bay, a, a cove, uh, an area where, the, where there was uh, protected land and an entrance into a small, what we call a cove, a small area of water that was protected from the ocean. And they sailed right in there up to the beach, and there was a stream coming across the beach down into the ocean. And they all you know, got out and got fresh water. And then Balder sent out two or three hunting parties. And within an hour, the hunting parties were back with deer. And they built big fires on the beach and and ate and ate and ate because they hadn't had very much to eat for many, many days. And so they spent the next two, three days trying to repair the damage on their boat that the storm had caused, trying to get their gear ship shape. That means all collected and, and ready to sail home. And there were, it was the morning of the fifth day. And they were all lying on the beach, sleeping. And all of a sudden, Lars sat bolt upright. And it was just, just before dawn. It was still dark. There was just a teeny, teeny, teeny little bit of light starting to show out across the ocean to the east. He sat bolt upright. Something was wrong. There were no sounds in the forest. There was nothing except the little waves in the cove lapping, that is, just bouncing on the sand. But something was wrong. And in a minute, Balder sat bolt upright. And they both were listening. There was no sound, but they don't, both knew something was wrong. And they started waking up the other guys. And in less than three minutes, all of them were standing facing the forest, backs to the water. And they all could feel it without warning. There came a noise, and an arrow flew through the air and into the throat of one of the Vikings, and he went down. In the next instant, the air was filled with arrows coming out of the forest. They couldn't see where they were coming from. They were just coming from out of the forest, and two more men went down. Then another man went down, and Balder said, we can't stand here. We've got to charge. And so they all had their axes and swords, and they charged into the forest. Nothing. There was just a little bit of light now. They could see trees, but the arrows kept coming. Nothing. They went 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards. They went about 60, 70 yards into the forest, they never saw anything, but the arrows kept coming, and men kept coming, going, falling down. And then, out of the trees, about 70 men appeared, dark-skinned, with painted stripes and symbols on their faces, and they were carrying uh, axes, but the, the axes were made of a wooden handle, about the same length as a Viking axe, but the, in the head of the handle was a sharp triangular piece of stone lashed to the head, uh, to the handle, head of the handle. And these men charged them. And in minutes, 
Vikings were down all over the ground, and all that was left was Balder and Lars back to back fighting, trying to hold these men off. And then Balder took a stone a club right into his forehead, and he went down. In the next minute, five arrows went through Lars's body, and he fell over dead. Now fast forward 1,200 years to two years ago, 2018, in Boston, Massachusetts. There was a family in Boston that loved to go sea kayaking. Now, sea kayaking, the kayaks are, are very stable and bigger than a regular kayak, and you can take a lot of gear, and it takes two people. They're not very tippy at all. You can take a lot of gear, and you can paddle along coastlines and camp at night. You can take plenty of camping, tents and stoves and all kinds of stuff. And a lot of people love to do sea kayaking. And this family was a mother and a father and a brother and sister, and they loved to go sea kayaking. And, and uh, in 2018, in the August of 2018, they decided to go on a trip up the coastline in uh, uh, New Brunswick, which is just in Canada, just north up the coast from Boston to Massachusetts. And the, the cool thing about New Brunswick is that a lot of the coastline is not developed with houses, and they, they wanted to make a three-day trip. So they got the kayaks and went up and started on their three-day trip. And on the second night, they were looking for a place to camp. And they saw a little cove off the ocean. And they pulled in there, and there was a nice beach and forest and stuff. And the dad said, uh, let's, let's do our camp here. And they set up tents and everything, and dad and mom started to put together uh, some supper. And the girl, who was 12 years old, loved to explore. And she said, Dad, Mom, can I, can I go explore the forest uh, in from this water? And Dad and Mom said, yeah, just about 15 minutes. We'll have supper ready, so don't be gone too long. And just stay close enough so that we could hear you. She disappeared. Ten minutes later, they heard a scream from the forest. And Mom and Dad and her brother ran into the forest. And here she came, trudging through the forest, dragging a muddy, muddy stick. And they said, are you all right? Are you all right? And she said, yeah, 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 I, I, I found something. And she walked out to the water with her dad, and they waded in and started washing the mud and dirt off the stick. And after about five minutes, Dad raised up an old, 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 rusted, rusted, pitted sword. And there was no, nothing on the handle, nothing on the blocker, all the leather had gone. But on the end of the sword was a round, empty clasp. And Dad rubbed, rubbed the blade of the sword, and he said, wait a minute. Look at this. And very, very faintly, 
they could see etched into the blade of the sword the figure of a dragon. And that was the end of the story. Now for those who would like to do some writing, for those who would like to write, I uh, would suggest you try your hand at this, writing a new ending to the story, and I'll set the stage. So here's how I'm changing it. So Lars and Balder are back to back. Balder goes down with a stone axe through his forehead. Lars, almost at the same moment, is struck by a war club, but the war club hits him on the flat side of the war club, not the edge, the flat side, and knocks him unconscious, and he falls to the ground. Now, why don't you have a chance at writing the new ending for the story?